Hi, I'm Aya Rodriguez Izumi. I've been invited to introduce our speaker today, Cecile Chong. Uh, so born in Ecuador to Chinese parents, Cecile Chong is an artist who lives and works in New York City. Her paintings, sculptures, installations, and videos address ideas of cultural interaction and interpretation and explore human relationships with nature and with another. She is inspired by materials, which she thinks of as signifiers, and is interested in how world cultures overlap and interact in previously inconceivable ways. Cecile recognizes the uncertainty that now looms over everything, from our economies to the weather, as well as the fragility of our civilization, despite the, univers the universality of its cultural underpinnings. In her work, she looks at traditional artifacts and wonders what tangible relics we may leave for future generations and what these relics may say about who we are and how we lived. She has received support from the Algira Center of Contemporary Art, BRIC, the Center of Book Arts, the Elizabeth Foundation, the Foundation for Contemporary Art, the Jerome Foundation, the Joan Mitchell Foundation, the Lower East Side Print Shop, Mass Mocha, Socrates Sculpture Park, the Bronx Museum, and Wave Hill. Cecile's work has been featured in solo exhibitions at Brick, Figure Works, Five Miles, Honey Ramka, Selena Gallery, and Smack Melon, all in New York, uh, Art Space in New Haven, and Emerson Gallery in Berlin. Her work is in the collections of El Museo de Barrio, the Museum of Chinese in America, the Center for Book Arts, and City Art Advisory. Reviews of her work have appeared in Hyperallergic, Artnet, Huffington Post, El Diario La Presna, Singtao Daily, Three Dots Water.com, and the New York Times. She received an MFA from Parsons in 2008 an MA in education from Hunter College, and a BA in studio art from Queens College. Her early schooling took place in Ecuador, Macau, and China. Please join me in welcoming Cecile Chong. Oh, thank you so much, Aya. Uh, well, hello everyone. It's great to see a few familiar faces already from the studio visits last Friday. Uh, I would like to start by thanking Mark Tribe for inviting me um, to this talk and also to Aya Rodriguez Isumi for helping me organize this talk. I want to start by saying that I'm logging in from Brooklyn and I want to do a really quick land acknowledgement that I am on the indigenous land of the Canarsie tribe of Lenape. Um, and by thinking about my audience today, I decided I was thinking about what would be um, meaningful and beneficial to the group. And I decided to share about my own MFA experience and also um, series of works that I have started during my MFA and how those works have, um, have grown and have uh, expanded throughout, throughout the years. All right, so this is me during my MFA, I went to Parsons. I was there from 2006 to um, 2008. And the reason why I wanted to show you this image is because the, I started making those little sculptures that you see uh, there, I think around 2007 during my second year at Parsons. Um, and also because of the window. I was very lucky to get one of the two studios with windows when I just started. And it made a huge difference because the summer before, I have started working with encaustic uh, to paint and to dip this, um, uh, this sculpture. So the material became very important. Uh, the next image is me making these sculptures that I call them wawas. Um, I will go back to give you more information about these wawas. But in Ecuador, the natives call wawas to babies or it's a baby or a child. Um, so in this photo, my friends always made fun of me that I got caught making babies. 
Um, and you could see in the back that there's the photo, the, the background, I have a window in my studio. Um, this is my studio now. I'm at Elizabeth Foundations for the Arts. Um, it's also called EFA Studios. I've been there since 2009. And in case you guys don't know about it, um, and if you guys um, live in New York City, you guys should know about this great foundation. There are 70 artists um, that have studios in this foundation and you can apply after you graduate. You can get a studio for two years. It's a subsidized uh, program. There are four levels of subsidies. And after two years, you can apply and, and have your membership renew. I've been there since 2009 and I really love it. It's a very like um, Manhattan size studio. It's less than 300 square feet and it's very compact, but I call it my oasis, even though it's near Times Square is actually pretty quiet. Um, so before I start sharing images of my work, I wanted to give you a little bit of background about my family. These are my grandparents, uh, Carmen Ameng and Olohi Wonsang. They um, immigrated from Canton, China in the 1930s. And first they went to Peru. There was a big wave of migration going from China to, to, to the US. But if you guys know the history of the, um, the, there was a Chinese Exclusion Act in the US starting from the late 1880s to the early 1940s. So uh, my grandparents immigrated in the 1930s. So that, that meant that they would not have been able to enter the US. Uh, I never had a chance to ask them if they have tried to come to the US, but they went to Peru. Um, and they also heard that there were better opportunities in Ecuador, so they moved north. Uh, I think they were merchants and they also happened to have five children in Ecuador. But my grandmother was extremely homesick and she always wanted to go back to China. Um, so my grandfather caved in and the family went back in 1948. They built a house in my grandfather's village and then the, the government changed, um, the communists took over in 1949. Um, I love to show images of my school because um, also the transition between cultures. This was from my elementary school in Ecuador. This is me here. And then when I was 10, my mom decided that my sister and I should go to Macau, the little Vegas in Asia, <laughs> where my grandmother was living, um, to learn Chinese. So my sister and I were there for five years. And this is me here. And then after those five years, I was 15 years old. And my sister and I, we went back to Ecuador. We were enrolled in an American high school where everything was taught in English. So um, just to give you an idea of languages also, like um, Spanish is my mother tongue. That was the first language that I ever spoke. Um, when I went to Macau, I was, I had to learn uh, Cantonese. So if you know about language acquisition, it's always like uh, you either, they, they use the description, it's like you either sink or swim, but I needed to go to the bathroom and I was, you know, I just had to swim by asking the teacher in, in Cantonese, it's like, can I go to the bathroom, you know, even though the accent was extremely heavy. Uh, and then at 15, back in Ecuador, in this American high school, I have completely forgotten my Spanish. And it was like relearning Spanish socially and learning English um, in school. So many years later, actually just last year, I created a um, stop motion animation that is called Fluency. And I was referencing um, this three languages, you know, growing up in these three languages and, and acquiring a language and also forgetting a language. So if you have a chance, um, please look at my website and let me know what you think. Um, and here, this is me and my sister and some friends in Ecuador. So there was always like the, uh, there was also a, an element of otherness uh, in my experience growing up. Uh, the context is that there were only 500 Asians in the capital of Ecuador in Quito. And that um, I think Chinese were their largest number. There were also a few Japanese and a few Korean families. Um, and 
if any of you have been to Ecuador, this is the important monument right on the equator. So it's latitude zero, zero. And I love to connect this, um, my background to like the middle, here's the middle of the world. And if you translate China, those of you who know Chinese know that, you know, China literally translates to like the middle kingdom. Um, so I like this connection between uh, these two middle kingdoms from different parts of the world. Uh, so this is my mom, uh, me, my sister, and my, mom, my mom's friends and cousins uh, who were visiting the city. And this is uh, a few years later in mainland China. And by looking at this house, it looks kind of new, 1976. And it's just interesting to see also this political propaganda. Um, if we know the history of China, uh, the Cultural Revolution ended around 1976. So um, these all these I remember, I didn't understand, but I remember seeing a lot of these wordings all over, you know, pasted outside of outside of these houses in all these villages that we would visit. The, uh, the house on the left was my grandmother's house. It still stands to today. Uh, this is my cousin. She was able to leave China in the 80s. So now she lives in San Francisco. And I actually gave her the Western name, Jennifer. And I knew it was, it looks like it was a very, um, it, was, it was the holidays because from the way um, the girls were dressed, uh, usually they would um, even go into school. They would not take books, and but they would take um, tools to work on the fields, you know. So coming from outside and visiting from Macau, it would be um, really shocking to, to spend three months in China every year during summer vacation and our Christmas holidays and New Year's uh, and spend time in mainland China and see how, how different the, the political systems were and, and how that influenced people's lives. Um, so an earlier painting, very different from the work that I do now, um, I think that after living in New York City for a while, uh, you just, not forced, but in a way, yes, to question about your own identity. And it started coming out in my work. Somehow I just needed to communicate this cultural experience. Um, so I decided to merge the color from the two flags, from the Chinese flag, red and yellow from the, of the stars, and also from the Ecuadorian flag, which is yellow, blue, and red. And then I also thought about how humanity, we all share nature. Um, so I started using green as, a, as also as a component of my work. So I did a lot of these abstractions um, for quite a few years. And then as I needed to express more about the cultural background and I have learned about encaustic, um, I started working with it. And encaustic is a hot uh, medium. I have to melt it at 200 degrees and um, I'm allowed to, the great thing is that you can, the medium is, feels like it's a paint, but it's also, it's like an adhesive. So uh, every painting that I make have around 25 layers of encaustic. And in between each layer, I add something. This is a piece um, called What a Treat from, 2010 and I made it, uh, I think it's like 30 inches um, brown. So there are three elements to my work. Um, one is that I use materials as cultural signifiers, uh, like, like what I, uh, I have just mentioned um, about my work. So I use rice paper, I pre prepare them and then I add them on different layers as a collage. I also use volcanic ash from uh, volcanoes that erupted outside of Quito, outside my hometown. Um, and I also use circuit boards material to represent how uh, nowadays, like we all use technology. We all share the internet. We all communicate through this platform. Uh, this is a piece that I just finished maybe three weeks ago. Another element is that 
I use um, images, I appropriate images from different children's books from East and West, and I put them in my own narrative. And this one's called um, Devil's Advocate. <laughs> and the third element of my work is that I use the image of a Wawa, like the Swato baby that you guys saw at the beginning, like the sculptures, and I place them in my landscapes uh, as fruit, rocks, um, or flowers. And nowadays they also basically represent humanity. Actually, they're here right now, right there on these baskets. Um, so I have always thought about using nature as a backdrop of my work. This is an earlier piece. And uh, I've been thinking about how we are all connected to nature, that we all come from nature. Um, and I hardly made any interior scenes. This one was, um, I painted this one when I was in school and I think maybe around 10, 12 years ago, An Angel Angelina Jolie was adapting all these babies from different parts of the world. So news like that kind of inspired me to create, to create this piece. Um, this one was done in 2018, um, and I was thinking about the absurdity and the cruelty of what was happening at, at the U.S. and Mexico border. Um, so I was triggered. I was triggered by the cruelty, and I also thought about family separa separation happening at the U.S. and Mexico border, which has to do with the underlying racism towards people from Central and South America. And I thought that this is really emblematic of the xenophobia and the general position of non-white immigration. So as we know, uh, almost 3,000 children have been separated from their families. And even as of last month, um, the parents of like 545 children could not be found. Um, so this, this piece is called DNA testing, the absurdity that this girl is trying to match her dolls to her to the dolls family and also their wawas in this in this egg carton. I also made a piece called Bully uh, of how this character have separated um, these living beings into different jars. And as you could see, like there, their wawas also on the on the branches in the landscape. Around 2012, talking about languages, um, how things like start bothering you and I needed the language part to come out. So I really sat down and I was thinking about uh, words that would have, um, that would have a starting sound in the three languages. So if I would find a word with those similarities, um, then I would, um, then I would create a painting. Um, so ball, those of you who know Spanish, pelota, and in, in Cantonese is ball. Uh, telephone, telefono, dinwa. I love the dinwa because the direct translation is actually like um, electrical conversation. <laughs> um, and then fire, fuego, fall. And I think I made a series of, um, of, of maybe uh, 12 to 15 paintings um, that I call them common dictionary. Scent, cut, chocolate is a kind of cheating because it's really like the phonetic sound in Cantonese is chikulek and then monkey, mono, malau. I'm still obsessed with dictionaries. So I am, um, I just ordered this one today that has like, a, it's a picture dictionary. So I always think about while I was learning a language, how, what a relief it was if the word came with a picture. Oh. So sometimes I also use pictures of dictionary pictures in my work. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about the material when you see encaustic paintings, uh, it, it is actually a very ancient medium. These might look very familiar to you. They're actually mummies from the Fayyam era, uh, from Fayyam and uh, from the Roman Greco era in Egypt. And what I love is finding out that actually there were women that painted these, even though they do not consider themselves artists. And for those of you who have questioned 
like how do you start being an artist? Like how old were you? Uh, what were you doing? What was your first drawing? And it was during my MFA that I really had time to focus um, and recall where were those moments. And it was pretty much during my MFA program that I realized, oh wow, I started uh, loving art when I was five through these paper dolls. Um, so I don't know if you guys have seen these, but my mom would get me a sheet of a paper doll and I had to cut all, cut every single shape out, including the tabs on the clothing, and you could dress the figure with different outfits. So later I realized I just wanted to create my own outfits and I was really looking for, for that moment to be able to just be quiet and in my own space. Um, and I feel like now I pretty much do the same. I love to look at um, books that have um, different, different figures and images. And uh, this one belonged to my mother-in-law. Um, she's, she's Dutch and she gave me her, um, her book when she was a little girl. So that's why it's in Dutch. And I also love these um, books in Chinese, um, the school books for children that was about hygiene and civics. Um, Okay, so this is actually one of my favorite paintings. Uh, it is called In a Different Light. I made it with four long boards. Um, this piece is in my studio. And um, I was never very sporty, but I love holding um, these objects in my studio and I can paint on them. And here is the detail for that piece. Um, and here are the circuit boards material that I will pluck out from old televisions or radios uh, and stick them in, in, in my own landscapes to kind of um, communicate, you know, the idea that we all share technology. Uh, here is, I cannot see myself, but here is a painting that I have at home. It's on a, a paddle. And actually years ago, I walked into a thrift shop and I love the paddle that I saw and I held it in my hands. I didn't know what to do with it, but I bought it. And then months later, I thought, oh, I could, it actually almost represents or reminds me of a, like a Chinese mirror or a Chinese fan. So I started um, creating work on, on paddles as well. So this is how I hang them. Um, the material has to be done on wood. So what I do is that I work flat and then I would apply um, uh, different layers of encaustic. I would fuse it with a heat gun and then I would add different materials. Again, another layer of encaustic, fuse it again. And then the last three, four layers, I would add the image. And the very last layer, I would carve around the image with um, this etching tool. And then I will fill it with, um, with oil stick material. So talking about cultural objects, um, I grew up with a lot. I think my mom was feeling very nostalgic about the Chinese culture. So in Ecuador, we, I grew up with a lot of Chinese objects and I feel like, oh, that stuff, you know, mom loves it. My grandmother loved it, but it's really not for me. And the plate on the left is actually my own photograph. Um, I took it at the Art Institute of Chicago in 2006, I think. And I was already making these narratives of my own, but I was really drawn to this plate. And I really thought that it was, when I first saw it, I thought it was the Dutch artist copying the Chinese, but then I've noticed that I was actually in the Chinese wing of the museum. And it was made in China. So it was really Chinese artists copying the Dutch copying themselves. So if you look at the figures, you know, the, the faces are Asian faces, but uh, the outfits are definitely not, you No, know? So I feel like that confusion and that entanglement of like history and, and culture, it was all in that plate. 
Um, and lately I have been very interested on researching the Silk Road. Um, and because of blue and white wear being this like um, transmitter of imagery um, across cultures. And what is the most interesting to me is that China had the technique and um, the Middle East had the cobalt blue. So there was that cultural exchange. And then as that exchange moved to different parts of Europe in every step, it became its own thing. So the jar on the right, it fascinates me to think that it was done in Mexico because um, it arrived to Mexico through Spain. And um, in Mexico, in Spain, it came from a place called Talavera de la Reina. And in Mexico, it became Talavera Poblana in Puebla. Um, so I started making my own blue and white wear and I started appropriating figures literally from blue and white wear or blue and white textile. So the boy comes from um, a blue and white jar and, and, and the merry-go-round comes from um, a cloth, a textile from France. So here it is like, the different paths of the Silk Road, uh, not only by land, but also uh, by sea. And I'm extremely interested. I hope to do some formal like academic research about the Silk Road and also travel to the Silk Road. And strangely enough, actually I have been to parts of uh, China uh, that where the Silk Road, you know, has happened took place. So from Xi'an, Donghuang, Urumuchi, actually I have a picture um, when I was by Urumuchi, but the sad thing was that this was 20 years ago and I was not yet interested on the Silk Road. So I feel like now I have to go back. So these are my blue and white paintings for now. Any questions? Oh, you guys can type them on the chat. Um, and then when we're done, um, we can go back to them. So this way I can continue sharing the screen, yeah? Okay, so going back to this painting uh, and making wawas, um, my inspiration is that I really wanted to have um, a South American element to my work. And I grew up in Ecuador seeing women carrying their babies on their backs um, throughout the Andes. Uh, and I was always attracted to them. And someone told me that actually a good swaddled, right? That the natives will swaddle their babies would be when the baby could stand on the table like a bottle. And I love that idea. And I thought, okay, what would I do in New York City as an artist with that information? Um, the image on the right is actually a Mexican tradition um, to find this, um, this little tiny, they're maybe like two inches, uh, like plastic white dolls in a rosca. In a rosca, um, it's like this type of bread that they make during Three Kings Day. So I always feel like different, different cultures have different traditions with either dolls or babies or swaddling. And I wanted to create my own. In Ecuador, we also have Wawas de Pan, which is um, for the Day of the Dead, um, which is served with this very thick uh, kind of sweet um, drink called Colada Morada. Um, so it, it's a very strong tradition from Ecuador. So I wanted to make my own Wawas. Um, this came from actually a maquette that I did during my MFA. And I used the wawas to com communicate ideas of universality uh, of humanity, but also about um, questioning like um, ideas of nature versus nurtured. The way we are, is it because um, of our parents or is it because of our environment? Um, and I also had the opportunity to focus um, on my childhood experience, like 
different things about childhood started, started coming back. And I thought about uh, my first day of kindergarten in Ecuador, where, when I was confronted with my first, like, um, my, with my first ident cultural identity. So um, I was pretty much a happy kid. And the first day of kindergarten, I had my, my classmates pointing at me the whole entire day and yelling, China, China. So I thought, wow, I must look really, really different. So by the time we got dropped off at home, um, the school bus dropped us off at home and the babysitter opened the door. I, I, I remember I pushed her aside and I ran to the bathroom. I climbed on the kitchen, on the, on the bathroom sink because I wanted to look at myself in the mirror. And then I saw my own reflection and I saw a pair of eyes and I was like, okay, great. Everyone in class had a pair of eyes too. And then I looked at myself I'm like, okay, a nose. And I'm trying to remember, oh yes, everyone in class had a nose and a mouth. And so I was so relieved. I'm like, okay, great. So I just look like everyone else. Um, so again, to mention about the context, there were only like 500 Asians in, in, in the whole entire city. Um, so I feel like little by little, um, my classmates got used to me and we got used to each other. Um, so I did, I did um, relate to what Lacan, uh, once said about like the mirror phase of a child that uh, during that phase uh, around 18 months old, um, a toddler sees his own reflection and recognizes he's no longer part of his mom. You know? So for me, I just felt like, okay, I recognized that I looked a little bit different, but I just felt this is, this is where I belong. This is where I was born. Um, yeah, and, and I think it also Foucault mentioned that um, that reflection uh, in a way was, was like a, a spaceless space. So it was, it was kind of, he talked about being the ideas of utopia in connection to this to, to this reflection, you know? But for me, I just thought I was really confronted by that, um, by those ideas of how to see myself, but I refused to see myself separately from the rest. Um, so I created this piece called Please to Meet Me, and it has morphed into um, different stages. I do hope this piece was actually called Solarium. I made a room with three different colors, again, as you see here, but the previous piece was an enclosed um, space and I put the wawas on the floor. And here I made um, three color panels, reflective panels, um, where people could see their own reflection. Um, this one was in Philadelphia at El Taller de Puerto Riqueño. And this one was in Dumbo Art Festival. I feel that um, eventually I would like to make it into a permanent public art piece. And this one was in Berlin. And back to the Wawas, um, I always wanted to create public art. And this one was my first public art opportunity. Maybe you guys know about Socrates Sculpture Park and the fellowship. I know that I is participating in the exhibition now through the fellowship. So congratulations, Aya. And I got to see her piece actually during the opening. Um, my piece was called Broken Cherries. I, was, um, I received the fellowship in 2011. And uh, what I did is that I wrapped seven cherry trees with coils that have natural beads. And uh, on the bottom, they were mostly like natural, made out of natural materials like wood or seeds. And then towards the top, um, it was mostly like machine nuts made out of brass. So what I wanted to communicate is the idea that 
um, that humanity at the beginning we traded, uh, you know, natural products, natural like food and potatoes and carrots. But now we're trading technology. We're trading like telephones and computers and and cell phones. Um, so yeah, my I I implanted seven wow, uh, sorry, ten wawas on on the ground, uh, and I also found a technique of how to keep them on the ground. So on the bottom. They actually have a, a, a rebar that extends out maybe like eight inches. And then I make a hole in the ground um, and I plug them in. And depending on the location, sometimes I also spray construction foam to hold it together. Um, and then around 2016, I was really um, bothered by the president's attitudes, um, hostile attitudes towards immigrants. And I decided to create something to honor the immigrant families in New York City. And I have read that 49% of New York City households speak a language other than English. So all these languages from all over the world, New York City is just the place. and. Um, and then I also had a child, childhood obsession, talking about going back to childhood, that uh, it's called El Dorado. El Dorado means the golden. And uh, there are many versions to El Dorado, but it's about when the Spanish conquistadores arrived in Latin America and demanded all this gold from the natives. And apparently the gold was turned in, but it disappeared in some kind of lakes. And as I mentioned, every, uh, Every South American country has their own version. And then I thought, what if I create my own version? And in my version of El Dorado, I wanted to honor the 49% of New York City houses that speak a language other than English. And um, I wanted to present it as a contemporary archeological site, right? So what if El Dorado would have been found in New York City? Uh, so to amplify the idea and the concept, I made 100 of these sculptures and I painted 49 of them gold. And they were four, first of all, they were installed in Sunset Park in Brooklyn. Uh, but that summer I was in New Orleans and at a residency and I realized, and I was thinking and thinking about the installation and I thought, um, there's something more about this installation that I had to do, you know? And then I kept thinking, it's about New York City. Um, so one day I just thought, I have to install it in every borough. So when I came back from New Orleans, I was connected through a friend um, to the Louis Latimer house and in Flushing, Queens. And it was perfect because Louis Latimer was an African American inventor and not too, maybe not too many people know about him, but he um, contributed to the invention of the light bulb. So at one point, I think like the filament of the light bulb was made out of horse hair or material that just wouldn't last. Um, so that was his huge contribution. He also wrote patents. Um, so his house is in Flushing, Queens and um, to honor his contribution to um, lighting technology, I spray painted um, the faces of the Wawa sculptures with glow in the dark paint. So they would glow in the dark. And during the day, what I would do is that I would give visitors um, like kind of like a black tube made out of cotton uh, so where they can um, put their head down by covering the whole entire um, sculpture and then they can um, put their face on this hall and then look down and see the, the sculptures uh, glow in the dark. Uh, it was really satisfying also because it was in Flushing Queens to see the signage in, in four languages, um, Spanish, Chinese, um, Korean, uh, and English. And last year, um, they went to the Bronx. So being installed in every borough per year. And um, they were part of an exhibition called Figure in the Floral. 
and um, I place them in um, also to make them somewhat site specific. I place them in a shape of a Lenape flower. So it's like four circles that were connected and then the stem coming out on this side. And I also made some of them kind of floral. Uh, this year, they are at Snack Harbor uh, with the Newhouse Center for Contemporary Art. And um, the, the way that I placed them was that I wanted to honor Snack Harbor's history, uh, maritime history, and also the history of, of Staten Island. So uh, the way I placed them was like an compass or an abstracted, um, an abstracted boat. So that's why. And I also wanted to uh, reference the way we live now, being six feet apart all the time. So I started from one and I literally placed them, you know, six feet, six feet apart going in uh, either direction. And, and then uh, the most that I got to place them in the center were nine of them. So I actually ended up with 81 sculptures. And then I thought, well, we're never, just by ourselves. So in some of the spaces, I double the sculptures, like they're 19 doubles. Um, so then um, they're like um, 100 sculptures all together. Uh, two weeks ago, I had the satisfaction of um, having a drone, like a friend ha has a drone. So he was able to uh, take some pictures um, and and get some video works with his drone. So this is one of the snapshots. Okay, so that is about El Dorado. I just wanna mention also that um, nature has always been part of my settings in my paintings and obviously installing my installations in New York City parks, which I feel that my appreciation is growing in that aspect. And in 2017, I applied to, um, I got accepted to um, the Wave Hill Winter Workspace. And for the first time, I had all these flowers and plants and, and it was winter. So all these flowers were dried and, uh, so it was a really new experience to have this compost pile be my supply closet pretty much. And what I did for the first time is that I, I, I made this vertical installation uh, using natural materials that I found and then I would dip them in encaustic. Um, and I created this installation also so, like I made the wall was kind of um, two dimensional that but I put them on a nest. And then that summer I went to New Orleans and I wanted to continue working in that vein, uh, but the flowers weren't drying because New Orleans is it's nice and humid. Uh, so what I did is that I, I started making a composition and as the material was turning color and dying, becoming withered, I would replace them with made-made material like foam and beads and clay. Um, this one is called placeholder. And when I came back to New York, um, I was invited uh, to exhibit in a show called Strange Flower. And uh, I created this piece for it. Um, it, was it was curated by Elizabeth Condon at West Beth. Um, so I knew that I wanted to continue working with these natural materials. And I uh, repurposed this uh, construction foam material that I had in my studio from a previous um, installation. And I used like 500 pins to push down all these natural uh, flowers that I have dipped in yellow and caustic. Originally, I wanted to make like a broken blue plate um, but the piece was coming out differently. Uh, so I titled it Chicken Little, like Chicken Little, the sky's falling. And it had to do with fear mongering. 
Um, and then this piece that was that has been my most ambitious um, installation so far. Um, it was titled Other Nature. I'm very grateful that this happened this year. I can't believe we're almost at the end of the year. Um, it happened, it opened in um, mid January and the, the exhibition ended um, towards the end of February. And then less than two weeks later, I was already in quarantine. So it started that in 2019, I was spending um, my summer with my mother in Ecuador when the fires from the Amazon started really calling attention. Maybe the Amazon, you know, the, the forest has already been burning for a while, but it was really being uh, mentioned in the news. So I remember how bad I felt, especially feeling so close to the epicenter and thinking about how humanity, the way we treat nature, um, that we take it apart, we burn it, we divide it into borders. We, you know, we just abuse it so much. Um, then I also thought about my experience during my MFA taking a class um, called Art Outside the Gallery. Uh, it was taught by Dara Mayers Kinsley. So I was already thinking about making art outside. Um, but Dara asked us a question that was, uh, that, that seemed so simple. It was like, uh, why do we feel so good when we go to the beach and we see the horizon and, and we just feel so relaxed. And, and when we go to the forest or when we go hiking and we standing among these beautiful trees, and we were 22 students in the class and we could not answer that simple question. And I think in purpose, she just waited and waited. So in like three, four minutes and we didn't have the answer. Um, and then finally she said, guys, that's because we are nature. We are part of nature. Um, so that has really, that has really stayed with me. And um, I'm also reflect constantly reflecting on it. Uh, I think during um, studio visits last week, we had uh, very good conversations. I think it was with Gregory and, and Sohi that we talked about nature uh, and different perspectives. Um, but so out of mother nature for this exhibition, I took out the M and called it um, underscore other nature for the way that we really treat nature as though it is the other. You know, like we completely treat it as though we're not part of it. Um, so I have worked on a fence previously in a smaller exhibition at five miles. And uh, I still wanted to make it grow. So in this case, I got uh, construction fences and I divided the gallery space in two. And I made one side look very lush. So the top and then the other side stunted, like it, things would stop growing. And I use, um, I collected like when I was in New Orleans, I was already prepping for the show. Um, and I was prepping for the show at five miles, the, the previous fence. So I have found these big palm trees, big palms, and I would press print, press, press print them uh, with glow in the dark paint. Because I, I, you know, living in New York City, I'm like, wow, these palms are so lush and so big. And I wanna, I wanted to keep it, but of course, it turns brown. So how would I keep the shape? So I would um, I would put paint and 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 print it and and kind of make a memory of it. So they were perfect for this fence. And um, I also took like artificial uh, flowers and leaves, and I painted them in different colors. What was really fascinating about um, this installation was that these, these fears here, that 
because people were already uh, hearing about coronavirus and um, this was in January and I would get questions like, Cecile, were you, is this referencing uh, to like coronavirus and, you know, um, but I really had no idea because actually if we go back to my experience at Wave Hill, if you see these fears that I've already intended to work with, and I actually put them inside this chimney because the space was dark and I was kind of working with the idea to make things glow in the dark because it has to do with lighting and, and interpretation. Um, so yeah, so I was not a witch. I did not anticipate coronavirus. Um, I also had, to make it site specific, I recorded the water, um, the water outside the gallery in Dumbo. And I also had a sound collage um, of all the, like how damaged uh, nature's becoming and all these issues with climate change. So I had sound of like, uh, forest burning, I had sound of water, of wind, um, I had sound of um, a parrot, my parrot, my mom's parrot called Sigma, um, that she would always scream out like, cogelo, cogelo, in Spanish, cogelo means grab, grab him. And for me, I just thought about ice at the border, at the US-Mexico border, you know, yelling out cogelo to to the people that tried to cross the border. So I, I wanted to include that, that sound that, that my mom's parrot gave me by accident. And of course the wall was on the floor. I made them glow in the dark. Um, so the issues of nature, um, it, it makes me think, it makes me think a lot. Um, and also, in relation to my work, I think about um, Homi Baba, the post-colonial um, theorists have said of how people did migrate. Um, he refers like the experience of having like an inscape. And I love that word because it's, it's something that you keep it in, you have inside is almost like the imagery of, of, the, of the landscape the experience um, and everything else that, that you have gone through. Um, okay, so, oh yeah, and about nature, just wanna add something else. Like um, during my artist talk at Smack Mellon, I remember bringing up the fact that we're really, when we think about nature, we think about Living in a city, uh, so I really like uh, the conversation that I had with Sohi about being a city girl and thinking about nature in such a different way. But, uh, you know, like living in a city or living, being indoors, the, the, the laws of nature still work like gravity, right? It's not like gravity only functions outdoors. So I think we have a we have a misconception about um, nature and outdoors that, especially for people that live in the city, um, we have to, in a way, clarify that for ourselves. Okay, um, so I just, let me check the time. Okay, it's 10 o'clock. I just want, because I thought about to stop the talk here, but um, I thought about Wayna who worked with um, Beats. And I also wanted to share really quickly in case a few of you guys have seen my website and are, and are curious about my bead work. So this is another, these are the, the installation and what I mentioned about the spheres. Oh yes, and I also wanted to share this with you. Uh, Hubert Reeves had said, man is the most insane species. He worships an invisible God and destroys a visible nature. Unaware that this nature he's destroying is this God 
that he's worshiping. So I also want to leave you guys with that thought. Okay, so beadwork, um, a side project, I'm gonna mention this very briefly. So when I lived with my grandma in Asia, she taught me how to bead. And um, I didn't know that I was actually doing piecework, but she would bring home these, um, these patterns that would be stretched on silk and it would be on a, on a, on a metal uh, square or sometimes rectangle. And for me was seeing those beads was really like candy being 13 years old. And I love doing bead work. And again, during my MFA, there was a project that asked us to uh, do something decadent and flashy. And I thought, what is cheap and flashy? And that really gave me an opportunity to go back to beading and also um, thinking about the time that I spent with my grandmother in Macau and in China. Uh, so I, I enjoy doing this, uh, working with these domestic objects as well. Um, and some of them are really big, like restaurant size. Um, so I made up a word called strangers, which is a play on words between a strainer and a stranger uh, to indicate ideas of like insider, outsider, liquid and solid, um, the exotic and the mundane. And I've been using, um, I've been using um, donated necklaces and accessories and also natural materials that I bring back uh, from Ecuador, like Tawa, Asai, Bambil, uh, Wairuru. Uh, so these are like um, native materials that I like to bring back that they're originally from the Amazon. And this one was from an installation that I did last year at, uh, in Dumbo actually, number one Main Street. And um, just this photo as reference, as I said, when I lived with grandma, I used to be that, be those purses. Um, and sometimes when I find them on flea markets, um, there's this funny question that I wonder, did I make that one when I was, when I was in my teenage years? <laughs> so this is what I'm, I was talking about. And nowadays, since I'm, um, kind of obsessed with blue and white wear. I also made uh, blue and white strangers. And I referenced the different type of um, blue and white um, ceramics. Um, so Wedgwood, Ming, like that. And I'm also experimenting with um, creating tapestries. And the reason was I was always curious about the process. And I'm thinking when I travel the Silk Road, what would I do? And I'm thinking maybe I would gather different materials from different stops and that, and then I would um, create these tapestries while I travel. So, okay, thank you. I think I'm done sharing images. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you so much, Cecile. What a wonderful presentation. Oh, thank you. You really ended with a bang with those tapestries. <laughs> it's, it's so wonderful the way you're able to pick up a totally new form or, or medium and just make it your own. And wow, um, <laughs> really wonderful. So um, there's a lot going on in the chat wow. while you're speaking and I'm just gonna, um, scroll through um, and I'll, I'll share some of the comments and then uh, offer you some of the questions. And if anybody in the audience wants to jump in between questions or comments, just feel free to unmute and speak up. Actually, if anybody has a burning question right now or something you want to say, go ahead and unmute before I start reading. Oh. Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. 
So I know that in your works, you have like some very obvious Chinese elements or reference in your work. And, but I wonder if there's like such situation that when, for example, you, one of your works doesn't, you, did, you didn't want to apply any like your Chinese heritage, but the viewer is like trying to connect your identity as a Chinese and like brings in those like interpretation in your work. And I wonder like, how do you address this kind of situation? Thank you for the question. Um, I feel that I really want my images to be placeholders uh, for the viewer. Um, so I want, I would like the viewer to identify to, to either the, Im the figures or the situation in the narrative. Um, whether, you know, they do not have to be of, of, of that ethnicity or what the figures in the narrative imply. Um, so that's why I always mention it as I want people to create their own interpretation. So when people see my work, they might think that, oh, I am, Cecile must be the adult woman, the adult Chinese or the adult Asian woman. But actually I relate myself more to the Western child because if the work is about East and West, you know, and I feel like, um, I love, I love, and I, and I adore and respect my my Asian heritage, and that of my um, parents and ancestors. But I feel like uh, I really, you know, spend more time in the West. So, um, as interpretation, I I relate more to the Western child. You know? So I really want viewers to be able to, to connect to the situation or to any of the figures. Did I answer your question, Yang Fan? <laughs> Thank you. So I uh, just wanted to share a comment that on also shared in the chat about the paper dolls and how they really connect with your way of assembling different elements in your works. As if, I mean, paper dolls could almost be like an allegory in a way for your larger way of working. Um, oh, wow, thank you. The composition of these works and the characters appearing in them, this is, I think, when you were showing the encaustics, are similar to Chinese paintings, but the dreamy colors and rich texture in the background makes the works different from that ancient painting method. Because the background of traditional Chinese painting usually has a large area of blank space, Mm -hmm. These works are wonderful, he says. It wasn't a question, just an observation. Oh, thank you so much. I just want to say, Xiao, that sometimes I would, uh, sometimes I would think that I wanted to reference the Andes, <laughs> um, the Andes in South America, and then I would, the painting would end up looking very Asian, or vice versa, you know, like I would start making um, like the Wawas, the, the Swato babies, um, referencing the Latin American, the native culture. And then they would actually come out like uh, the mountains in Guiling in China. You know? So um, yeah, but thank you. So uh, um, has a, 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 a question. Mm -hmm. um, she says, thank you for your great presentation. It really was a great presentation. Um, from your talking, we noticed you moved three countries and spent different life stages in them. Which period, you, uh, more, which period influenced you more and why? The time you stay in USA is longer than others, but your works look more influenced by Chinese culture. Mm -hmm. um, I know sometimes I feel that I came here when I was 19. So I came here for college. And even though I have spent so much time, my whole entire adulthood in the US, I feel still very connected to my roots. So um, I think more and more as I grow older, I started to understand more like 
ideas of um, and experiences of migration that no long no no matter how long you are in one place, uh, your roots are still this still call you very strongly, and. Um, yeah, at the beginning, I was like, you guys saw the first painting that was very colorful. Um, it looked, it looked very Ecuadorian, I would say. And later, um, I think when I also started working with encaustic that my paintings took this very Asian vibe. And by using, um, and by adding those figures, it almost puts it like a stamp that it is like an um, like an Asian artwork, you know. Even though I do not necessarily intend it to make it uh, look Asian, but I think the the vibe of of the material and the way I use it um, kind of it comes out that way, you know. Um, yeah, my father used to be a sculptor, even though he never called himself an artist. And he created these, um, these like Chinese landscapes, but three-dimensional kind of on, um, in fish tanks, but really huge. And sometimes when I look at my work, I'm like, wow, this kind of reminds me of his work, even though, um, I only live with him to the age of four, you know? So, um, so these are elements that, that, that come out and sometimes you don't know the reason. I mean, in my case, I just work very intuitively um, and that's how the work is, is coming out right now. Um, and once it's done, I question why did it come out that way? And then I would reflect on it, analyze it. Um, but a lot of times is, I think most of the time it's not like I'm gonna go out and create this Asian looking artwork. Yeah. Mm, that was muted. So, okay, um, next question. Um, do you ever get concerned about those beautiful encaustic paintings being perceived as crafty or decorative? And those are in quotes. I think the negative implication of such comments uh, it itself is problematic, but I still get self-conscious about falling into those terms about being you know, described as crafty or decorative, making work that is too well-crafted or too, too pretty or beautiful, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um... Thank you for that question. I mean, I love it because uh, I do think about it. Um, but I, I'm not going to worry if my work looks crafty. And especially during nowadays, when we question about dismantling um, all these structures that we have grown up with, and as artists, we think about how can we decolonize our practice as artists? You know, so I've been thinking about how in Western art history or in Western art, which is, you know, from Europe and from this part of the world, that we think like oil paint and, and, and acrylic, those are the painting mediums, right? But in a way, who created those rules? And I feel like in my mind, I've been maybe decolonizing my own practice already by using natural materials, by not following um, certain rules of Western art history, you know? And also um, making work that is crafty um, with lots of labor, you know, like referencing also materials and, and process, different types of processes that come from um, like native cultures or, yeah. So I'm actually excited about, about that. And I am aware, um, but also using beauty to bring people in and also, uh, and then have them question, you know, because it's like, 
the what was in trees and in boxes and in baskets. Um, it could be kind of dark as well. <laughs> so you just talked about decolonizing your own practice. And I just thought it'd be worth pausing on that because decolonization is a word that is used a lot more, say in 2020 than it was in 2010 uh, in uh, art worlds, you know, by artists and others, curators. Um, you know, there's an influential group called Decolonize This Place mm -hmm. that has been involved in organizing protests uh, at the Whitney Museum and elsewhere. And I'm wondering if you could just unpack for students who maybe aren't so familiar with the discourse of decolonization, what you mean by that? I mean, you explain how you want to do it, but if you could just talk a little bit more about how that term comes to your vocabulary and how, what it means to you, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I think it's good that we question um, structures that we have grown up with. That's number one. And I feel that as artists of color, um, we've been trying to find ways to, um, to question and how to, how to go about our work and how to be an artist, how to be truth to our own practice and also fit in to the larger, I don't wanna say like to the larger art communities, let's say, right? But um, as a Latinx artist or as, as an Asian, um, Asian artist, um, I do also question that for myself, like how would I do that with my own work? So it is, it is a relatively new idea. Um, and I was very surprised to realize, realize it for myself, like a few weeks ago being in, a, in an artist group um, called Asianish that we always question about, it's not that we always question, but we're trying to question uh, what is it that we're doing um, to decolonize our work or our practice. You know? So I really don't have an answer right now, Mark, but uh, it is definitely in my mind. Um, I mean, thinking geographically, like where I come from in Ecuador and also about thinking about native communities, thinking about um, all these communities that need to be, they need a lot of help. Um, think about Black Lives Matter in the US, right? I mean, there's so many structures that need to be reset. So I feel like even during this quarantine, it has been a very exciting year, a very exciting time for us to be able to be separated, but also together through these meetings uh, to be able to discuss these new issues. So it is relatively new to me as well. Um, and I must say, I do not have a clear answer um, answers for you. Um, but I feel that I just want all of us to keep questioning. So this community here of students, um, plus Aya and myself, um, we are a mix of post-colonial subjects, that is people who live in post-colonial or who, who emerge from post-colonial societies and cultures, places like Mexico and um, uh, parts of the United States and, and elsewhere. But there's also people here who come from colonizing societies, uh, you know, myself, uh, people from uh, Europe, from um, the People's Republic of China, uh, who, who were uh, colonizers 
uh, or de descendants of colonizers, not, not colonized. Um, and it, well, the PRC is sort of both, right? Um, and not everybody in the PRC is the same, but I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how decolonization might be a relevant discourse for people on the other side of that historical legacy, if you understand what I'm asking. This is maybe, you know, you, you don't need to take that question, but it's on my mind. Yeah, no, but I feel like it, it has to start from somewhere. Um, it might be a very messy beginning or a very messy discussion um, at the beginning, but I feel like we as a society, we need to start uh, having this type of discussions and being aware um, and um, just talking to our families and talking to friends and accept differences and also um, accept, accept that history could have been different, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, I just feel like even having conversations um, with my own family um, about different issues, that that has been a start. Now, in Ecuador, we also have a lot of issues with uh, race, with social classes. Um, it's a very class-oriented society. Um, so how can we um, how can we start to restructure somehow? Hopefully, this next generation will be will be better than this one. <laughs> yeah. Um, so before I continue reading questions, <laughs> questions in the chat, does anybody else um, have a, a real time question? Anybody else want to just speak up and, and ask? A question. I love these comments, guys. Thank you so much. I uh, just out of curiosity, would there be a way that I could keep the comments or the question? Yeah, we can share them with you. Okay, great. Wow, I have to read that hyperallergic home is a foreign place, Mark. <laughs> okay, so um, Daniel uh, asks, um, he says, it's such an interesting presentation. Uh, I also moved around many countries. It was questionable and uncomfortable to be asked for a specific identity. And sometimes I felt like an outsider in all places, in where I was born, where I was living, in the moment. Have you had any such experience? Having no uh, home? Yes. Is this... This, this came from Daniel, you said? Yes. Uh, yes, Daniel. I feel that um, in Ecuador, I'm considered to be a Chinese, um, and now that spending so much time in the US, I'm a Chinese gringa. So when I go back home, actually, even my best friend says, oh, welcome home, Chinita. <laughs> um, in, in China, I'm, I haven't been there um, in quite some years, but at that time, my sister and I, we were always referred to Guaymui, like foreigners or ghost girls. Um, even though, you know, um, the appearance would be one thing, but once we would open our mouths, it would be like, oh, that accent, that is not Chinese. You guys are ghost girls. <laughs> um, <laughs> and here, um, I'm considered to be like a, a Latina um, Chinese. So um, Daniel, yeah, I'm always considered um, as an outsider as well, but I also think that, um, you know, we are all outsiders either because, you know, um, of our height or of uh, the way we dress or, you know, there's always, I think it's part of human nature to look for differences and I'm trying to, remind myself of that um and 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 um yeah that outsider um issue is also in my work um so i try to address that 
in different ways. Uh, I feel like the Wawa's looking like ghosts or tombstones or, you know, maybe um, somewhat phallic or, you know, there's an outsider um, element to them, even though they're really like universal uh, looking because I also want them to represent humanity. I hope I answered your question. I'm gonna go ahead and read another question from the chat from Paulina. I feel like a lot of decolonization work takes the road of deconstruction, but it seems like your work decolonizes through inclusion. Wow, would you agree? Wow. It's not that um, I've been trying to decolonize my work, but lately I've been thinking about, um, ab about the material that I use, you know, that I, I no longer use oil paint. I no longer use acrylic. You know, I use these natural materials in a way, even in caustic, it's like beeswax cooked with resin um, and beads that I, I love to bring from the Amazon um, that I actually wanted to show you guys here is a um, stranger that I hand beat. I forgot to show you guys um, with dental thread actually, because I want it to last. <laughs> so, um, so I really didn't mean, I wasn't thinking consciously, but I am very re rebellious. That's part of my nature. So I wonder if just intuitively I, I became rebellious years ago and I was able to communicate that through my usage of material. Um, yeah, but what was the, uh, the other word? It's not decolonizing, but what is it that I'm doing? Well, so she said, so I'll just repeat the, it's such a good question, so I'll repeat it. Your brilliant, uh, no, uh, let's see. A lot of decolonization work takes the road of deconstructing. Oh, okay. So it does decolonization through deconstruction, a kind of, you know, taking apart uh, a kind of deep structural critique. But she says, it seems like your work decolonizes through inclusion. Mm. So the, 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 the contrast she's drawing, the distinction she's drawing is between deconstruction and inclusion. Mm -hmm. Makes you think also of the difference in a way between calling in and calling out. Yes. Call, inclusion being a kind of, you know, a calling in of different cultural uh, identities, uh, different cultural formations and practices and embracing the hybrid. Uh, deconstruction being this more like, you know, taking it apart without offering some new synthesis, I suppose. Is that, Pauline, do you wanna elaborate at all on your question or, or offer any additional thoughts? I mean, that's pretty much the idea because I, I see you talking about your uh, you know, your Latin background and then your Chinese background and you're an artist working in America. And it, I mean, you, you mentioned decolonization, but it doesn't seem that you're attacking anything. It just looks like you're including your own background in the work. It, it somehow makes a louder statement. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Paulina. Um, I guess my intention is also like my work, my work is not about like identity or, um, or identifying the differences, you know, like this is Chinese and this is Ecuadorian and this is American. I think I really aim for my work for, for us to be able to identify with each other. You know, so um, I think that is important to me. It's, yeah, the, the separate identity part is, is not important. Uh, so I think when I mention about my figures being placeholders, I'm, I'm very interested in that. It's like bringing, bringing us together. That's what, uh, as you said, like, um, yeah, to, to be able to identify ourselves with each other. Mm -hmm. Is there another um, live question? Is there somebody who would like to speak up and 
ask something? Is that, there's another one in the chat, but this would be a good chance if you haven't, if you've got something on the tip of your tongue to just speak up. Okay, so um, uh, says, uh, there was lots of traditional Chinese cultural elements in your work, especially in your early painting, which has composition of traditional Chinese painting and blue and white porcelain you use as an installation. Does this traditional medium represent the culture of China for you or does it have some personal connection with your experience? Uh -huh. um... I don't, I didn't mean to create uh, like Chinese looking paintings at all. I, um, I think the closest to studying art um, in Asia when I lived there from the age of 10 to 15 was Chinese calligraphy, but it was all writing. It was never, it was never creating a landscape. So I really don't have training in, um, in Chinese art at all. And I actually had any, hardly had any training. Unfortunately, my high school didn't have um, art classes. Um, I think the only art class that they had was mechanical drawing. <laughs> um, yeah, so I feel that the, the material that I use somehow or somehow the way I use it, um, it, it comes out like that. And I, I do understand um, the intuition um, of creating like negative space uh, in, in a landscape, um, like, like they do in Chinese landscapes with a lot of negative space and to, to signify water or, um, or sky, right? But um, everything is really intuitive for me. And it's not that I make this conscious decision. So I applied the wax, um, as I said, on the on wood, and then I fuse it with a heat gun. So I feel also that a lot of my work is like between uh, chance and control. Um, so maybe when I make certain decisions that um, I don't know, maybe the Asian side takes over. I really don't have an answer for it. <laughs> maybe someone in this group can help me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one more question from the chat. Uh, uh, Carolina uh, writes, uh, because your connection with Equatorian and Chinese cultures is from your childhood memories. Can we understand that the mention of these cultures in your works is more of a self narrative than something that can represent both cultures? There's a lot of fiction and romance in what you have presented tonight. <laughs> I take that question to be kind of sharply critical, saying that it, maybe it's really more about you than being able to represent those cultures since you really only experienced them as a child. But uh, so, um, Prepare to defend yourself, Cecile. <laughs> oh, to, the, to the floor on a couple. Uh, it sounds like there's a vague suggestion that you uh, you're guilty of cultural appropriation. <laughs> I'm, I'm heightening the conflict to try to get some drama here. It's uh, me. I uh, my tooth is is killing me. So sorry, I can't speak much <laughs> because it's, I have a pain okay, here. Yeah. Okay, uh, but I am Brazilian, <laughs> and uh, I always have problems when I have um, the talking about Latin culture and Hispanic culture because it doesn't represent my culture, so I don't feel like represented. And sometimes when someone mentions South America, Latin America. I feel so lonely, <laughs> so isolated yeah. from this discourse. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I'm a part of it. So yeah, I prefer to imagine that the, your work is about you, more about you and the, your origins mm -hmm. than about those cultures. And I don't think that's a sharp critic. It's <laughs> like, 
It's, it's okay. like my interpretation. <laughs> I'm just trying to gin up some controversy, yeah. some drama here to keep everybody away. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Uh, I do hope that you feel better soon. But uh, yeah, I will extract tomorrow. <laughs> oh no! Well, yeah. I'm glad you're here tonight. Uh, let me see. I am staring at your question right now. I think it has to do with both. Like when I started, when I graduated from my BA in studio art, I was an abstract painter. And I also, there was a very rebellious part of me that I didn't want to deal with uh, any cultural objects, you know, like the blue and white wear was just very old fashioned to me. <laughs> um, but somehow after living in New York for so many years, I felt that the need needed to come out. And I also felt that in a mentor, actually, guys have a lot of mentors. That's one of my advice to you. Um, one of my mentors said, go for it, Cecile. You, you know, like talk about your narrative, talk about your cultures and you have authority over it. And um, with the encouragement and with my need to, to address these cultures, um, I, I feel like it came pouring out and I also need it I, until now and I need to continue. Um, and also I love materials. So once I gather something in my studio, I always ask myself, why this material? Why does this um, catches my attention? Um, so then I start peeling the layers, right? The concept and why this? Why am I doing this? Why this material has meaning to me? Um, and then that's how I, I realized, okay, I think this is what I have done. Um, do I answer your question, Carolina? <laughs> and yeah, your mentor was, uh, Latin American. No, she's German. Ah, uh, okay. So <laughs> she biased also. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna um, invite one last question from our students. Mm -hmm. Now is your chance. <laughs> Five, four. Oh, hello, Cecily. Yes, uh, hi. Okay, I love your like presentation. I already had a conversation with you, but it's really good to see your works and your process and your culture like everything is really amazing and like up to the Carolina questions could you give me a little more like example when you're like like thinking process when you choose the material because I also really interested in the very different kinds of material but I always has a uh problem why i choose these materials and why what this material is related to me so could you give me more like explanations about your thinking process about it sure um so i realized that i um towards the end of when i was painting making abstract work um i already started realizing oh i love different materials so for example volcanic ash, right? There were all these different volcanoes that would erupt in Ecuador and I would see pictures and I was not there and I was, I was missing this big event. So I would tell my family, can you collect some volcanic ash for me? And my stepfather would say, oh sure, we just have to like dust it off the bookshelf, you know, because the volcanic eruption has been so huge that it went all over inside houses. So I had this jar of volcanic ash sitting in my studio for years. And when I started uh, making paintings with encaustic, um, I realized I wanted maybe Carolina, uh, uh, Carolina, you mentioned the word nostalgia or someone <laughs> mentioned the word nostalgia, which is kind of like a no-no, but it's okay, you know, um, that I started using um, 
the material, and then I realized, why am I using this material? You know, I feel like it's a, it, it was a missing opportunity for me that I didn't see the volcanic eruption. I didn't experience it. I wasn't near it. Uh, but having the physical uh, object or material in, in my studio, I could apply it to my work. So little by little, I started becoming very aware um, of what material represent to me. So even from gold, from El Dorado, you know, what does, what does gold represent to me? So actually, now that you mention it, so he, for my um, MFA thesis, I actually um, took like different materials and I wrote what, uh, what it wrote to me, uh, what it meant to me in terms of, um, you know, some kind of meaning. Um, and it was extremely, extremely satisfying. Um, I think a good exercise is also like, you know, lay out all the colors and write down what all these colors mean to you. You know, like every color has a different meaning uh, to us. So in a way materials became signifiers through this process of, of, of responding and, and thinking of them in terms of, um, in terms of place or culture, you know, yeah. I hope it helps because you also use um, a lot of material, um, a construction material, yeah, from what I remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome, thank you. Okay, Cecile, thank you so much. I feel like I've learned a lot about your work and how you think about it. And um, I really appreciate your generosity with us tonight. Thank uh, you so much for having me. You're welcome. <laughs>